It's an overwhelming honor for me to be with you this evening. Just flown in from Central Europe, where for the last several days I've had the chance to speak with leaders from across that region, dear friends of ours from NATO. And of course, there's a real sense now of what the future will hold for all of us. And as I think about what the future will hold for all of us, I think what the future will hold for Israel. Peter, thank you for your inspiration. Uh, it truly inspired us in the work that we did. I have done this now twice to work to set the security environment so the negotiations of a two-state solution could go forward. You inspired us in that work. The IPF inspired us in that work, and I can't thank you enough on behalf of all of us that worked so tirelessly with our Israeli, Palestinian, and even Jordanian counterparts on how much this meant to us. Thank you so much. And Susie, thank you for your leadership. Uh, it's, I have not known you as long as I would have liked, uh, but I've, I've known you now to the extent that I consider you a dear friend. And the leadership that you exert every single day with an IPF motivates and inspires all of us to make this organization essential to the future of our relationship with Israel and to the future of the negotiations for the two-state solution we all desire. General Amnon Reshef, uh, you don't know this, but when I was a young officer, uh, I studied your forces and I studied your specific efforts as a commander in the Yom Kippur War. It was a great inspiration for me. Inspiration of a commander leading forces in impossible environments against impossible odds, ultimately to win through the victory that would preserve the Jewish state and Israel. And you are a hero, not just in your own country, but you're a hero to many of us here in America as well. And I thank you for your example, and I thank you for what you do for us every single day to inspire a new generation of American officers as we go forward in this uncertain time. Thank you, sir. And Dan, thank you. It's so good to see you today. I didn't know when I would see you again. You know, we went through an awful lot together during that period of time. Uh, I, I could not have imagined what you were dealing with every single day, the, the weight of the American-Israeli relationship in so many ways resting on your broad and strong shoulders. And I can remember Many were the day that I would come to brief you on the outcome of our particular mission. And as you may remember, ladies and gentlemen, I was in the job for about 15 months. I was in the region 13 of the 15 months, and we spent a lot of time together. But you always made time for us, no matter how busy you were, no matter how great the or important the crisis with which you were dealing at the moment, how weighty the environment in which you were leading the American relationship with Israel, you always made time for us. And you're sage wisdom and guidance and your patience went a very long way to helping us to achieve what we did in this measure and in this work that we did. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, because I did just fly in, um, I thought tonight, rather than spend a lot of time on the technical details, of the work that we did, which of course have been so marvelously captured in this report, I wanted to speak from the heart about how I came to find myself involved in this way uh, with Israel. Um, and I may be a bit emotional in the process. Uh, it was an early morning, it was a June morning, 1967. I was 13 and I was dead asleep in my home in Virginia. And it was my, as it was my father's want, uh, who always would say goodbye to me in the morning, 
he gently gripped my shoulder and said, Son, get up. Israel is fighting for its life. The Middle East is aflame. Very early in the morning for television in those days, but the news shows were offering special coverage of what would be one of the greatest military victories in modern history, the Six-Day War. My father and I would remain glued to the television for the entire war. We saw, and when we saw those images of Israeli paratroopers worshiping at the Western Wall in Jerusalem, we knew that we were witnessing something extraordinary. And when I looked at my dad, I was surprised to see him weeping for joy. This was the man whose destroyer was torpedoed by a German U-boat in the North Atlantic even before World War II began and would fight his way all the way across the Atlantic and all the way across the Pacific. And his ship was anchored within sight of the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay in 1945 when the Japanese surrendered. And later he would fight in the Korean War and he would design the U.S. strategic communications that enabled the Navy to dominate the seas against the Soviet Navy during the Cold War. This good man, this hard man, was weeping tears of joy. The Jewish people were safe, and Israel would survive. You know, I'd never be the same again. My parents raised me to believe that I had a stake in a world, in world affairs responsibility to make things right if I could. My dad was raised in some tough neighborhoods in Philadelphia. And from his earliest memories, his best pals were Jewish kids, tough kids who treated him like a part of their own families. They'd all grown up together. They'd endured the Great Depression as a group. The Jewish people were precious to him, and he and my mother Irish immigrant stock raised my sister and my brother and me to hold the same beliefs. The Holocaust horrified him. He could barely even speak of it in our home. But he never relented in making sure we all understood that we bore some responsibility for the safety and the protection of Israel. Many years later, as a major in the Marine Corps, I'd be honored to teach in the political science department at the U.S. Naval Academy. And I leapt at the opportunity to teach Middle East politics. And among the many topics in that course, I taught a module on the Middle East wars. It's the only place at the academy it was taught. I wanted my students, I wanted the midshipmen who were headed for service in the Navy and the Marine Corps to understand what winning looked like. But I also wanted them to understand who the people were in this region and the faiths which animated their souls. So I brought in rabbis to speak to the midshipmen. And we visited the imam at the National Mosque. It was for them I'd hoped a little of what my dad had given me. I, of course, tried to balance the course in my treatment of history, but I was my father's son. And I remembered one day, one of my students, a young Arab exchange student, and I spent a lot of time with the young Arabs at the Naval Academy, helping them to adjust to America and to our military way, came asking me for help with an issue he was encountering in the brigade of midshipmen. During my conversation with him, I asked him, in a kind of a moment of silence, I asked him how he thought the course was going, completely matter-of-factly. He looked at me and smiled and said, Oh, it's a good course, sir. We all think you're a Zionist. <laughs> Many years later, with these life experiences, in two wars in Muslim countries, I would retire from the Marine Corps. It had been a long haul. And I was tired after 38 years of service and 33 months in combat, and I was going home to Virginia go into the private sector. But I had barely hung up my uniform when John Kerry called me and he asked me to join him in the reinvigorated peace process that President Obama was undertaking for a second effort 
in his administration. I'd been part of the first iteration and had come to know a terrific number of IDF officers and civilian leaders, among them Amis Kulad, Amir Eshel, Asaf Orian. This call from Kerry reprised, in essence, my previous role and would see me as the senior advisor to the Secretary of Defense on Middle East Security, working with Kerry, working with Secretary Kerry and alongside Martin Indyk in building, we hoped, a security plan to support the two-state outcome. And here we would labor under the supportive eye of Lieutenant General Benny Gantz with the day-to-day -day leadership of Major General Nimrod Sheffer, an officer who would become like a brother to me. As it always was with us, our number one goal in the outcome of our efforts the safety of the Jewish people and the security of Israel, a pledge I made personally to Prime Minister Netanyahu when I presented him my introductory letter from President Obama. But it was also clear we sought to support a two-state outcome, and so a secure and sovereign and independent Palestine was also an objective, though it seems a distant hope today. For 15 months, Americans labored alongside Israelis and Palestinians and sometimes Jordanians to fashion a security plan which could support and provide a platform for progress on the other final status issues. While the details of the resulting effort remain classified, much of the substance was captured by the magnificent work of the Center for New American Security, CNAS, led by Michelle Obama. I'm sorry, Michelle. <laughs> she could lead it, actually. <laughs> led by Michelle Flournoy and the year-long report headed by Ilan Goldenberg, the report Security System for a Two-State Solution, which was published with the superb support of the Israeli Policy Forum with Susie's leadership and in conjunction with commanders for Israeli security and the leadership of General Abnon Reshef. And here a dear friend, Major General Gadi Shamni, played a courageous and an extremely important role in providing the vision and the explanation of a highly credible Israeli combat commander in supporting the report's findings. And I can't overstate the importance of his role in this effort. The bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of my 45 years of service in the U.S., I've seen what I believe can be a workable security solution to support the forward movement of peace. It will be hard, and it will take years, it might even take decades, to implement all of the pieces. But for the sake of Israel, there is no other viable option. Given the state of the region, it seems remote now that we can see our way to the fulfillment of this plan. There is so much hostility and so little trust that it seems nearly impossible to imagine that there can ever be a viable peace. But now I go back to the history of Israel. Last week, was the 69th anniversary of the UN General Assembly vote to accept the plan to partition Palestine, which would give birth to the state of Israel. And in that short 69-year period, Israel has overcome nearly impossible challenges to its existence to become the beacon to the region and the world no one could possibly have imagined in November 1947. And so it is with peace. But while it seems impossible today, we must envisage an outcome where the Jewish people are safe and the state of Israel is secure, but with a young Palestinian state next door, a security partner, not a security threat. 
exposure to the realities of what we face in this undertaking are not academic, nor are they theoretical. I believe we have it within us, we have it within our reach to achieve this outcome. The last year when I resigned from my position as President Obama's special envoy to the Global Coalition to counter ISIL, another recent problem, I had a long talk with John Kerry the day I left the State Department. And as we shook hands, he said, almost in passing, should the opportunity ever present itself again to be involved in the Middle East peace process, would you come back into the government? Without hesitating, I told him that until I take my last breath, if there is a chance for peace in the Middle East, I'll give up whatever I'm doing and come off the bench to re-enter the process. And as I walked out, Thank you. And as I walked out of the building, I thought my dad would be happy. So, so thank you for giving me a few minutes to, to speak from my heart to you tonight on this issue. This is really one of the central issues of our time. I wish God's rich blessings on you all, God's rich blessings on the state of Israel, and may God bless America. Thank you. Thank you.